Hello, dear friends. I'm Samuel Moore, and welcome to Talking Music, the show where you get to enjoy long-form discussions with superb and fascinating musicians. My brilliant guest today is the world-renowned jazz guitarist, Martin Taylor. Martin, welcome to Talking Music. Hello, Samuel. Really good to be here. Thank you for asking me. I've, I've been looking forward to this. The pleasure's all mine, Martin. Thank you for being here. Now, Martin, when I do Talking Music discussions, the first question I normally ask my guest is, can you give an overview of who you are? But it strikes me that for you, this would be quite a strange question. You're probably the most famous guest I've had on the show to date. Even if people only have a passing interest in the guitar, they probably know the name Martin Taylor. This being said, it strikes me that although many people are familiar with your creative output, fewer are likely familiar with your backstory, how you came to be the great musician we all know and respect. With that in mind, would you mind starting by giving us a brief overview of what's been your musical journey? Where did it start and how has it led you to where you are today? Well, it's quite a long backstory, so with, without sitting here and going on forever. <laughs> um, it started for me uh, around about 1960. As a, uh, so what would I have been, four years of age? Um, yeah, probably 50, actually 59, because I was given a ukulele when I was three. And I just, it's very, it's a very funny thing because it, it's like I, I don't really have any memories uh, of not playing a stringed instrument. And I can remember my dad coming home with that, with that ukulele and, and playing it. So I, one of my very earliest memories and just something completely clicked with me. I just, it's like I, it was deeper than just having a, a like a, a toy or a, a music, something to play with. It was like I suddenly connected with life. And as soon as I played it and the sound came out of this guitar and that feeling of the vibration and everything, it's as if I was born at that time. And um, because of that, and I got a guitar a year later, a little half size guitar, really because of that, um, there were many things that I didn't really understand. When I went to school, a lot of the time I didn't know what they were talking about and <laughs> everything seemed quite a mystery to me. But if I could relate something to music, then I could understand it. So music was, was never a hobby for me. Music was kind of how I interpreted life and still is to this day. So very often if I can relate something to, to music, then I, I kind of get it. So that was really what happened. Now, my, my father, he, he took up playing the guitar around about the same time I did. So uh, we were learning together. Funny enough, Julian Bream had the same experience because Julian Bream and his father went together for guitar lessons when Julian was just a, just a lad. So they were learning together. So it was a bit like that for my father and I. And so when I got that little half size guitar and my dad always listened to jazz, you know, a lot of the classic jazz, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald. So that was the music I heard. And of course, Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli. And we would sit down and he showed me a few chords. Uh, so I was very, very young, four, four or five years of age by then. But what really struck me was when I heard Django Reinhardt play. And the way I can describe it is, um, I remember saying to my dad at the time, um, I don't know, lived probably a few years later, probably about six or seven years of age. And I just said, to, I said, when Django plays, uh, it's like his guitar is talking to me. And that's the best way I could describe it. And really, it was because he, Django was such a, a lyrical mu musician, such a lyrical improviser, that it was like a, it's like somebody telling you a story. And that's why I, I really 
uh, even though I didn't really want to play necessarily play like Django, I just I just loved what he did. And I used to learn little just little phrases because I I couldn't read or write music, so I'd, I'd um, I would just like learn little phrases. My dad would teach me something like Sweet Georgia Brown. <laughs> And I'd hear Django would play. It's a little phrase like that. And I would find that, they, that those little phrases would, would, would fit in. Then I got to the, the point where my dad said one to me one day, he said, I'll tell you what, he, he said, you be the guitar player. I'm going to get a double bass because you can never get, <laughs> you can never get a bass player. <laughs> so that's really how everything started for me and then my dad had a band that he used to play at, at weddings and village dances and things and he was playing in jazz bands around the london area we lived very near london when i when i was a kid and i used to go along and just he, he said can my boy get up and play a few tunes and i just get up and, and play away i knew a lot of those a lot of those tunes and by the time i was 14 i was playing in a a band, a, a drummer called Lenny Hastings, who was very well known in the in the, the British jazz scene, and he formed his own band. And he asked me to join. I was only fourteen, so by the time I was fifteen and I could leave school, I decided to leave school, not stay on, and just pursue uh, a, a career in music. Just see what happened. I just jumped in the deep end, and of course, we didn't have uh, we didn't have um, jazz education formal jazz education in those days the way you learned was you played in bands you got into a band and you played with other other musicians so that was really my starting point then i joined a band after that uh when i was 16 and we went on the qe2 went to america and then that that was really the that was the start of my career so when i did that 1973 that was 50 years ago so i'm celebrating sort of 50 years of of being a, a professional musician so and, and, they're the early days so and may i say as well I mean, it sounds very much like to a certain extent music and the guitar chose you rather than you chose it is that a fair analysis yes we it's like we were naturally brought together you know and there have been times in my life many times when i said oh i don't want to really do this anymore I wish i could find something else to do and this is something that's really interesting um when i look back at my career I remember when when I came back from America on QE2, I started freelancing as as a like freelance gigging musician. I only did it for a very short time, but I was I was married by then. I, I was married at nineteen. Our son was born when I was twenty, so I was a, I was a young dad. So I, I had responsibilities for a young age. So I used to do all kinds of gigs. Um, one of the problems I had was I wasn't a very good reader. I could read music, but I wasn't a sight reader. So there was some there was some work, very often more lucrative work as a freelance musician that I couldn't really do, um, because, because I I would it would be I would be out of my depth because I would have to be able to sight read. And so a lot of the musicians at that time, professional musicians I worked with, they said, you know, if you really got your sight reading together, you could do studio work. You know, you 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 clean up. You 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 know, you could do all of that kind of work. Um, but I never really got that together uh, uh, at all. And I'm kind of glad. Um, it did me a favour because if I had. If I'd have been able to be a really good sight reader, also if I'd have been able to play in lots of different styles on the guitar, which also I couldn't do, I was just a jazz player, then I could have gone into that direction and it would have been very nice. It would have been kind of lucrative and, you know, I could have been home every night from, from a studio, but um, that definitely wasn't to be. So I, I'm kind of grateful for that because, you know, a lot of us musicians, and it's very common with, with jazz musicians feel you need to be able to do everything and and i went that kind of specialist route and it got more and more specialized uh, uh, along the way so it, it made my life very very interesting and uh, i often think you know if i had been able to read sight read music well um i would have gone into another another direction completely that would have been very nice i'm sure but i don't think it would have been as interesting and i wouldn't have contributed uh um the way i have 
uh, the way I, I, I believe I have to uh, to music, what I do, uh, because I'd have been away doing something else. Whereas I was this way, I was out there actually doing it, being heard, being seen, and then later on actually passing that knowledge on. That's a really, really interesting point. And what happened after that then, Martin? So you started out, you went to the QM, QM2. QE2. Q, sorry, QE2. Yes, yes. And, and what, what happened after that? Where, where did the journey go from there? Okay, so when I, I came back to the UK, came to London, and I started doing, during the week, I would play lots of jazz gigs because I had all these connections. But they were like small places. They didn't pay much money. I had, as I said, you know, I, I was married, had, had a young child. Um, so I needed to make up, um, on a practical level, <laughs> make up the money. Uh, and at, at weekends, I used to play at weddings and bar mitzvahs and uh, all, all kinds of things. The, the the studio work was kind of limited for me because it, it just it was just if they needed a guitar player that could do the kind of thing that I did um, because I as a, you know I couldn't go into a, do a film session and have the music in front of me because I wasn't that kind of player um, so I would I would do the, the the jazz gigs and then between that and then doing some commercial um, like and what would you, what would you say, uh, corporate work at, at the weekend? You know, I was making a, a living uh, as a musician, but I was always a jazz musician. My heart wasn't really in doing other things, and I wasn't very good at playing other kinds of music. I wasn't, I couldn't really play country music or rock and roll. I was a jazz player. But then, as uh, I started getting more of a profile playing jazz, and then traveling a bit more around the country. Uh, around the UK, not really working uh, overseas that much. Um, I I met a guitar player called Ike Isaacs, who was really became my mentor. And uh, Ike was on a radio show, which I remember as a kid called Guitar Club on BBC. It was fronted by Ken Sakura. And lots of guitar players used to be on that. Young John Williams used to be featured on it. Um, young uh, uh, Paco Pena. Um, all, all different styles of guitar playing. Eric Clapton played on it. But he, you know, it was it was this wonderful uh, uh, radio program. So I remembered him from that. Then when I, at the age of nineteen, almost twenty, I my dad used to play often at the Hundred Club in Oxford Street, very famous jazz club, which of course then kind of became more famous as being the the breeding ground of the birthplace of punk. <laughs> uh, but so so I used to go there when I was a little kid, you know, when I was when I was quite young. So I knew the guy that Roger Horton who who owned the place, and he's I was there with my dad one day, and he said. We've got Barney Castle coming here in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, would you like to play do the support gig? So I thought, wow, Barney Castle, I'm like a hero. That would be amazing. I couldn't believe it. Well, I actually get to meet him and all this. You know. So I went and did that gig, and I met Barney there for the first time. And later on, we Barney and I worked together quite often. And I was in the great guitars for a while. Um, but in the audience was Ike Isaacs, who I knew or knew of. And Ike lived in Wembley, and he said to me, come over to the house, we'll have a play. So I went to his house, and he sat down, and he played. And he just, it was the first time I'd really heard a jazz guitar player, although he would never, he would never call himself a, a jazz guitar player. He was, a, he was like a harmony guy. Uh, he knew a lot about uh, musical harmony, and he played the most beautiful um, completely unaccompanied solo things, mostly of like jazz standards. And he said to me, play me something, I sat down. So I'd heard Joe Pass by this time, which really inspired me. I thought, wow, there's somebody doing exactly what I want to do, but I didn't, I, all the jazz guitar players I heard were all playing single line, playing like horn players in, in groups. This is guy is actually sitting down playing fingerstyle and playing taking the same role as a piano player because I only ever heard that kind of thing from from piano players not guitar players so anyway I said uh, play me something and I'd heard Joe play um, here's that rainy day very 
very popular with, with jazz guitar players. So I sat down, he said, play me something. So I played, here's that rainy day. Something like this. So chord chord melody, what we call chord melody. So you find the chords, you get them, find the, the melody on the top, of, find the inversion, you can put the melody on the top. Very basic way of, of, of playing solo jazz guitar. So when I finished, I thought, well, that was okay. I wonder what he thinks of that. And he, he said to me, that's really boring. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll do my best. And he said, no, I said, well, I said, well what would you what would you do so he he said well i'd probably do something like this and he played this i remember he played something like this uh, going on my goodness what's going on and we sat down and oh, oh my grief and he started playing and he's going through all of these things i actually when i left the house probably about three three hours later going to my car i, I almost fell over i was dizzy i was actually almost fainted <laughs> <laughs> by all of this and i suddenly it was like a, 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 a my mind my consciousness was expanded that wow wow that's that's exactly what i exactly what i want to do and around about the same time i was doing a jazz gig and a guy came in and uh he said hello he said my, my name's peter boizo peter boizo's name he said, um, I, I own a few pizza restaurants uh, in London and um, I like to put jazz on, but I've, I'm opening a new one. I wonder if you'd like to do it with another guitar player. So I said, OK, so anyway, Peter Boizo was the founder of the Pizza Express chain and a massive jazz fan. That's why you always have jazz at, at Pizza Express. So, so um, the founder of the Pizza Express chain was a huge influence on me and a, um, somebody that did so much for me uh, in, in my early days, Peter Boiso. And he got me to play. I got to play with some really f famous older generation jazz musicians. And he, he was very active in promoting my, my early career. But he opened a place called the Pizza on the Park, Hyde Park Corner. And, and he said, if you can find another guitar player, I think it'd be really nice, maybe a Thursday night. Uh, so, so I happened to be at Ike's place and Ike was playing with Stefan Grappelli at that time, the job I did two guitar players later. And I said, so how are you, Ike? And he said, oh, he said, I'm not working with Stefan anymore. Uh, he said, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just doing a few things here and there. And I don't know, it was something I, I thought, shall I ask him? Uh, and I'd be a bit cheeky, you know, and I said, I said, I've been asked to do a Thursday night two guitar uh, gig. Would you like to do it with me? And I thought well, he's going to say, oh, come on, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, you know this is guitar player with Stefan Grappelli. And he said, do you know what? I'd love to do that. I think that would be really great. And said, I haven't done anything like because he was basically a studio musician. He He'd only started playing in public when he started playing with Stefan just a couple of years before that. He wasn't used to playing in the public and used to get very nervous actually about playing in public. Well, I used to get nervous going into a studio. And uh, so he said one thing, he said, I would love to do it. He said, but I don't want us to just go in and just pick tunes and just play them. Let's work out some arrangements for each tune. So I used to go to Ike's house a couple of times a week and he'd come up with some tunes and he worked out these brilliant arrangements beautiful arrangements for two guitars uh, 
making it sound really, really big. And I just played what he told me to play. I didn't understand it. And, and he said, right, I'll play this. I'll play this. Uh, then you play, you play it low down. And then when I play this, then you play this line here. And I just played it. I just thought, this sounds great. But I didn't understand it. And when he showed me a lot of the things he was doing for years, I didn't really understand it. And then one day, I suddenly realized I was doing it. All the things that I'd learned from him, suddenly, it was a bit like learning a language. You know, I know you speak other languages. So, you know, when you're, 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 you're learning another language and it's kind of clumsy and everything, then one day you're talking and you just go, oh, I can speak French. <laughs> <laughs> it it almost comes to, you, comes to you by osmosis almost. Yeah. And it suddenly, it suddenly came to me. So he was really, Ike Isaacs was really the man that opened everything for me, thanks to, to Barney Kessel. And uh, then he started playing me recordings. So I thought, is there anybody else playing like this? You know, after he played, he said, oh, yeah. So I got a lot of my, my ideas came from George Van Epps, the great seven string jazz guitar player. He said, I used to listen to him when I was a kid. I came from uh, Myanmar. And he said, I, we used to get it on the radio as to hear him, hear him playing and Eddie Lang, uh, the, you know, the real early, early jazz guitar players, Carl Kress. Uh, so he played me that. And then, of course, I'd already heard Joe Pass. And of course, he knew all of these people uh, as well. And then he, he played me a recordings of Lenny Bro, who I hadn't heard before. And that, that was mind blowing. And, and then, of course, I, Ike's house in, in Wembley was a meeting place for guitar players. And he, but he was very broad in his whole um, approach to, to guitar. So guitar players of all different genres all used to go around there. You'd go around one day, John Williams was sitting there, go around another time, Herb Ellis was there. Another time it might be <laughs> Eric Clapton or someone. You know, uh, everyone went, went around to Ike because he was such a lovely guy and he's so welcoming. And everybody learned something from Ike. What he did, interestingly, Ike always used to say to me, uh, I'm one of the back room boys. He said, I've, I'm in the laboratory working out things to play, and then I, I like other people to play it. So he would very often, he would, he would phone me and he said, Martin, could you come over to the house? He said, I've worked something out. He said, but I can't play it. <laughs> he said, but you'll be able to play it. Because I think I, have, I had a bit more nimble technique. I didn't have his musicality, but I had a bit. I was more, a little bit more dexterous than he was. And he would play something for me, then I'd play it back for him. Yeah, that's it. That's it. He's, I was struggling to play it, but you, you can play it. And so he was very, very generous, very, very generous like that. And he was somebody that all the guitar players that knew him used to. Uh, look up to him used to go to his house there's wonderful photographs of wes montgomery sitting in the very chair that i used to sit in wow. with, with ike and ike showing him something try he said try this man try this man wes, <laughs> okay <laughs> you know joe jo, joe pass was there and tau Farlow, all the all the all the great every every uh, george benson george was used to go there whenever he was in london because if you went to Ike's, apart from all this great guitar playing and, and knowledge that you were hearing, uh, he'd make you the best Burmese curry <laughs> <laughs> outside of uh, Myanmar. Um, so everyone used to love going around to Ike's, Ike's house. So I was very fortunate and I, I'm so indebted to him. And something I impart on all young musicians, the importance of having a mentor or mentors and I, I was very fortunate that I had Ike and I had more more than one as my father there was Ike there was Barney Kessel Stefan Grappelli I mean what, what a list of mentors fantastic what I was about to say because this kind of leads me to where I was hoping to go with this so we've talked about the incredible influence of Ike Isaacs on on what you do I'd like to hear where the Stefan Grappelli story comes into this, because was mm. that the next stage leading on from where we've just been? 
Yeah, pretty much. Now, even though Ike was working with Stefan Grappelli, I did meet Stefan through Ike. Actually, only just 10 minutes away from where I live here in Scotland. Um, they were doing a gig and I went along. And um, I met Stefan there. That would have been 90. I wasn't actually living here at that time. Uh, that would have been 1976, I think. And I went along to the gig and I met Stefan, but just chatted very briefly. And I just said, oh, the guitar, young guitar player that, that I know. And oh, hello. Uh, uh, Stefan was warming up in the dressing room. We had a whiskey because he liked to drink. And he's like, like a whiskey before he played. And we stayed for the concert. And that was kind of that was kind of that. But I knew a lot of musicians that worked with Stefan. And it's the same in whatever musical genre you, you work in. You kind of know each other, even if you haven't actually met uh, everyone. You know, in your world of flamenco, I'm sure even if you haven't met s certain players, you know who they are. They know who you are, even if they haven't met you. Uh, yes. so it's kind of like that. And it was like that in, in jazz. So I used to play at a very well-known uh, jazz club in London, in West London, called the Bull's Head in Barnes. It was a room at the back of a pub, but it was, it was a jazz club that had been there f for, for years and years. And despite it being a rather <laughs> scruffy little room at the back of a pub, it was a very prestigious venue to play. And I used to play there with a piano player called Tony Lee, who kind of booked the whole thing. He had a, a wonderful piano player. And I used to play there quite often. And you never knew who was going to be in the band. You would turn up and uh, whoever was there and then you get to know who, who everyone was and one of the bass players that used to play there from time to time was a, a guy called F phil bates and phil was playing bass with stefan grappelli at that time with ike and and then after ike as well um so uh, i just did a gig one night and then phil said to me after he said what are you doing what are you doing next week uh, and I said, well, I've got a couple of them, nothing, nothing really much. He said, we've got th three gigs in, in two gigs in France and a, 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 TV, a TV show and a, a gig in Belgium with Stefan. And he needs a guitar player to, 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 uh, to, to we need, we need a guitar, another guitar player. John Etheridge was playing the guitar at the time, but Dis Disley, who actually started the, it was the, the whole thing with, with Stefan, he'd gone off to Spain. I think they'd have a little fallout or something. I'm not exactly sure. Um, so I took Dizzy's place. So I went to I went to France. I actually missed the first gig because I went to the wrong town. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, that's it. I'm fired before uh, I've even done the gig. But anyway, I, I saw Stefan the next night and he, he said, oh, don't worry about it. He said it was it was the manager's fault. He, he told you the wrong wrong town. So it sat, we sat in the dressing room. It was in Deauville, in the north of France. And Stefan started playing tunes, and I started joining in. And then, because I was only 22, and then he played another tune, and he said to me, how do you know these tunes? Because <laughs> he thought I'd be a rock and roll player, you see. I said, I, I grew up on, on you and, and Django. That's, that's what I know. I said, oh, this is incredible. A young... A young guy who, who knows all this music and he said i don't have to tell you i just play it and you know it i said yeah i do i know all that music uh so we did these other dates and i thought well that's going to be something i can tell my grandchildren one day i played with stefan grappelli in france and at the end of it we were on the on the train he's and he said um he said i've got a tour of america uh in september would you like to play on it would you like to come on it i said yeah of course so I went to America with Stefan. We did a tour. This was 79 by this time. Then after that one, he said, oh, we've got a UK tour. Would you like to play on that? Yes. After the UK tour, oh, we're going back to America. And, and this went on for 11 years. So there was never a point where he said, you're in the band. <laughs> but it was, it was, so I was working with Stefan for 11 years, but I was continuing to do all of my other things at the same time. But it opened so many things for me. I went to America. Then Stefan's agent in America started booking me on my own as well. So I'd go, go there on my own too. I met so many great musicians. 
um, the famous musicians I worked with, and I started to work with them. So, and I started to be, I started to play internationally and began slowly but surely to become known internationally uh, for what I did. And that was all thanks, thanks to Stefan and got to play on recordings with, you know, got to play with Peggy Lee, uh, <laughs> uh, Toots Steelman. I played on three of the Yehudi Menuhin uh, albums that Stefan made and went on the Parkinson show and, uh, no, you know, a number of things got to know Parky very well, became good, good friends. Um, and um, yeah, so that was then that was having um, having these two mentors, Ike and Stefan, well, of course, my father for this. Stefan would have been my third mentor, really, as my dad getting me into playing. Ike showing me the direction. Um, Stefan getting me out there into the world playing, then I kind of felt that I really established a career because my early career as a kind of a freelance musician was very short. It was a very short time, maybe six years. That's all. Once once I started playing with Stefan, then um, I became sort of an international, I work in internationally and I got a recording contract with um, Concord Records out in California, and a whole new world opened to me. And that's really what I—that's been the trajectory, as it were, that I've been following ever since. Well, that is that. There's some marvelous stories there, Martin, and thank you very much for sharing them with us. It, it strikes me as well what a what a unique experience to grow up listening to musicians' works. And then you get to be in that chair. Mm. I, I imagine most people never get to have an experience like that. Was there a moment when you were sat on the stage thinking, I really can't believe I'm actually doing this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm touching history and being part of it by doing this. Every night I used to sit on stage and say, I must remember as much of this as possible. So that even now I can recall, especially if I hear a recording, of Stefan playing, whether I'm on it or, or not, I hear Stefan's violin, I can hear that in my left ear, that far away from me. I can hear that magical sound. And I can still recall uh, some magical moments. Not only is it playing with um, musicians that inspired you in the first place, but a musician that's a legend. He was a living legend. And through that connection, that music that inspired you and those people that inspired you, you become part of their history too. You become part of their legacy. So that now when, you know, there are books written about Stefan and, and about Django and my name's in there. And, you know, when, when people talk about that, uh, that era of music, and then what happened after that, very often, you know, my name is, is spoken in the same breath. So it's quite amazing. But it would have been very easy for a young person to be quite blasé about it. Go, oh, yeah, this is good. But I, I wasn't. For some reason, I thought, I must remember this. This, is, this doesn't happen to everybody. Absolutely. There's some wonderful memories there, Martin, and I really can't thank you enough for sharing them with us. We've talked quite a bit about your early development and your work as a collaborator in ensembles and how you kind of honed your craft. I'd now like to pivot towards the area of your career that I suppose most people watching and listening are most familiar with you with, your work as a solo jazz guitarist. Mm. So we touched on this a little bit in the discussion a moment ago, but I'd like to go into it in a little bit more detail. So perhaps you could unpack for us a little bit. What was it about solo jazz guitar playing that first really grabbed you? And what is it about it that sustained that fascination throughout your later career and made you commit a huge part of your life to that side of the art form? Again, this goes back to my dad's record collection, because one of the artists he used to listen to was Art Tatum, the, the great virtuoso jazz piano player. Horowitz used to go and watch him play 
and study him. <laughs> I mean, he was just this incredible musician. And from that, I started, I heard Fat Swallow and Stride Piano Players. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if you could do that on the guitar, you know, and have that ability to do that? Because it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's tricky enough on the piano, but on the guitar, it's, it's like a mystery. Because at least with the piano, it's all in front of you with the guitar. Where, where on earth is all this on the guitar? And I've, you know, I've, I've only got these, these four fingers here, you know, there's not 10 fingers there. Uh, so that was that was really the spark actually listening to piano players and then as i said when i met ike i suddenly went oh i can and of course joe pass i can get into this on the guitar so that became my focus now i always played with a pick uh, at this point i realized i've got to play finger style now i'm completely self-taught and I, I never had any lessons. I just kind of picked things up as as I went along. So I just had to, by this time I was living in a, quite a remote area of Scotland. And, uh, and then every so often going off and, and working with different musicians, working with Stefan, and I'd be home on my own. So whenever I picked the guitar up, I was playing solo because I had no one to play with really. <laughs> <laughs> like Johnny No Mates, you know. Uh, so I just didn't, you know, the pick. I just never, I just put it down there. And I just started playing the fingers in a very rough kind of way. I've always rested my little finger here. Um, it's not really touching anything. It's just a kind of a little comfort thing that I have. And I started... I started playing like jazz lines, but using finger style rather than the pick, and then you know figuring things, figuring things out as I as I went along, realizing that moving away from chord melody, just that, that kind of block chords with the, the melody note on the top, and then getting everything moving, getting all that the, the Ike the Ike did, um, I, I just yeah I, I just started to. This was the problem. Now, this was the problem. I had the ideas in my head because I'd been listening to all these piano players. I've been listening to Bill Evans and all the all the great jazz piano, McCoy Tyner. And so I knew what I wanted to play, but I didn't know how to do it. And then when I got onto the guitar, I realized I couldn't play the guitar well enough. I wasn't a good enough guitar player to play the ideas that I had. So I had to up my game as a player technically i had all i had the ideas lots of ideas but i couldn't play them <laughs> I, I wasn't good enough <laughs> so i just had i just sat around and there was there was a time when um i went through a little bit of a, a tough time where i didn't have any work for a while and i was even thinking of quitting playing but i couldn't think what i could possibly do Unfortunately, I didn't have a, a, another s set of skills that I could fall back onto. I could only play the guitar. In a way, that was good. Or if I'd had a qualification in another job, I would have taken a job doing that. I didn't have that. I had to keep going. I just had to, to, to do something. So I just stayed at home and played guitar. And I was kind of struggling. I was selling. I had a few guitars and I was selling them. I had, that, I had one guitar left that guitar there in fact which i gave me as a birthday present and uh but i had contacts in the jazz world i contacted a guitar uh, uh not a guitar uh, a jazz promoter that i knew in lincoln called barry story who used to put i did many gigs with him and i said to him could i come and do a solo gig for you if nobody shows up and i won't charge a fee or anything or, or if I, if it's a disaster, I won't charge anything. I said, but I've, you know, because I'd contacted a, a number of other jazz promoters that I knew and said, could I come and do a solo? Okay, and they said, solo jazz guitar for a whole evening. No, you can't do that. And so I, I just, nobody wanted to book me. And he said, yeah, okay. Cause he was a bit mad. So he said, yeah, okay. And I went and did the gig and I played all night solo. I'd worked out what I was going to play and um, kind of timed it. Of course, when I did the gig, 
I was about 20 minutes short because, you know, things just kind of move a lot, a lot, a lot quicker. And I thought, well, I haven't got any other tunes to play. Fortunately, going back to the, with Stefan, because I grew up with jazz, I knew all, so many of the tunes. Kind of a stroke of either a stroke of genius or sheer panic. I just said to the audience, any requests? <laughs> <laughs> So they started shouting out tunes to me. Uh, and a couple of them said, oh, well, yeah, okay. And like, oh, yeah, I know that one. Okay. So I played that one. And then any more requests, some other requests came out. And I did the last 20 minutes set just playing, playing requests. And, you know, not particularly inspired, but because I'm an improviser, I, could, I knew the tunes, I knew the melody, I knew the, the harmonic structure, the chord sequence. I knew things that I could do uh, around that. I just kind of improvised for, for 20 minutes on some jazz standards. And when I walked off, I felt I, I felt 12 feet tall. And, and driving home, I thought, wow, I've just played a whole evening on my own. And nobody threw anything at me. They came up at the end and said how much they loved it. And I got paid. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to, everything worked out well uh, and I said this this is really what I want to do but it wasn't that simple because then I went back to promoters and and because I didn't have management or anything and, and trying to convince people but once I did a few and the word got about then it was actually very difficult for me to go and say well actually I'd like to take a piano bass drums with me and this no no we want you solo we want you solo <laughs> And what, what happened as well, and I didn't realize this, it wasn't until I, I met a number of classical guitar players later on that were you know, a bit younger than me, to my amazement said, oh, we all had your that first record you made of um, artistry when I was with Lynn Records. It said, we all had that record. All these young classical guitar students at that time all got that record, I suppose, a kind of a rebellion. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, Martin, that's my favorite album that you've done, actually. Oh, really? Yes, Artistry is my favorite. Wow. Well, that I made that recording. Even I had to convince the record label because I'd made a couple of records before with a group. And I said, I'd like to do one completely solo. And they went, oh, no. And the only way I convinced them to do it was I got my friend Steve Howe to produce it. And I said, I've got Steve Howe to produce it. And he said, oh, we'll do it then. <laughs> <laughs> and I, nobody realized, I didn't realize what impact that would have. What happened up to that point, my audience were 100% a jazz audience. When I made that recording, I tapped into a guitar audience, just people who love the guitar and I don't think I think it's very difficult. I've never I don't think I've ever met anybody that was said to me, I hate the guitar, the sound of the guitar, certainly an acoustic guitar. Um, it's just it's a it's a sound that resonates, if you pardon the expression, resonates with everybody. And then I started to get invited to play at classical guitar festivals. Um, I started being I was invited over to Chet Atkins, uh, asked me over to Nashville playing his convention and a lot of a lot of guitar events internationally and also because I was playing solo I was an easy <laughs> I was easy to travel you know it was, it was it was easy for me to get around so um I was fairly low maintenance so um yeah this opened up another world so in a in a way it kind of the jazz world kind of became a little bit neglected even though I am known uh, in in the, the jazz world probably i'm probably better known it as a guitar player than as as a jazz musician but i am a i am a, a jazz musician that is 100 percent uh my my background my my roots uh yeah so that's that's how the whole solo guitar thing really really came about and more recently uh as much as i love playing solo guitar one of my favorite combinations is to play in guitar duo. So I have the um, a few guitar players that I, I work with in duo, Frank Vignola in America, 
Borelli Legren, who I've known since he was 13. <laughs> we've uh, we've just finished a tour in the, in America as well. Ulf Vikanius from Sweden. We play a lot in Asia. And when you find a, a guitar partner who you can have that musical conversation with, who you can, especially when you're improvising, that you can trust 100% who will follow you, you follow them, you get this thing. It's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And with, with two guitars, you can get so many great things happening, even outside of improvisation um arranging wise you can get some you can you know a chord here you can you can play one play the chord a stretch chord down here somebody up here and it sounds like a great big piano uh, i made a duo album called double standards where i did exactly that i played both guitar parts and that was one of the most fun i've ever had in the guitar studio <laughs> just indulging myself uh in in that and I, I think, yeah, I mean, in, in your in your area of music uh, as well, working working with other guitar players too, and I know in the classical world, um, I love to hear two classical guitars together. I, I can understand that. And it's interesting you say that because I've long been of the opinion, I don't know if you'd agree with this, I think duo is the most difficult ensemble to do well. Because on the one hand, you're completely exposed, almost like you're playing solo, but you're also completely dependent on someone else and there's nowhere yes. to hide. Yes, because there is that element of solo playing in it mm. somehow. You know, if I if I add a bass player or other instrumentation, I have to play in a different way. I have to leave a lot of things out. As, um, you know, I can't play in the lower register because the bass players there. If there's a keyboard, I have to be very careful that I'm not playing things that will clash with with the keyboard. So, but with with another guitar player, you know, we're kindred spirit, spirits, and you you find you find certain players that you have that bond with, and they're all different. Sometimes I play uh, guitar trios as well, and that's very interesting. I do the some of these great guitar tours and I have two other guitar players with me and you just change one guitar player and the whole dynamic changes. It's very interesting. Uh, it becomes a completely different group. <laughs> just that one, just that one player in there. And, and then that, that makes it really interesting because it, it doesn't make it different in, in that it's better or not as good. It's just different. And it inspires me to play, especially with improvisation. Absolutely. In your earlier answer, Martin, you've unintentionally led me to another subject I wanted to talk about in relation to your career. I think at the time of us doing this discussion, you've put out over a hundred albums, some mm. under your own name as a soloist, some as a band leader, some as a sideman in other people's ensembles and some as a collaborator. Now, I've had the pleasure of listening to quite a few of them, and I certainly have my favourites, as I'm sure many of your fans do, but I'm really curious, of all the albums that you've recorded, what are your favourites and why? <laughs> oh, that's difficult, you know, because I'm, I'm my biggest critic. <laughs> um, I would say that Double Standards album is one that I, I can listen to. The way I, I wouldn't say favorite, I would say the ones that I can listen to without grimacing too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, yeah, of the duo, that, that duo album, of all the Spirit of Django albums that I made with the group, um, Last Train to Hodeville was because I had so much fun with that because I wrote most of the music and arranged it. And by that time, the band had been together for quite a while and we were we were pretty tight. So um, some of the recordings I did with Stefan, there was one we did called, I think it was called Just, was it called Just One of Those Things? It was, we played the music of Jerome Kern and, and it was beautifully, there was strings on it, it was beautifully arranged uh, as, as well. Of my solo, albums yeah and artistry has a special place although when i listen to it i think well i could i could have done that better you know that's where i was at that time that's what you have to remember when you listen to recordings you listen to a recording you, you did 30 odd years ago and say, so, well that's how i played then 
you can hear it's the same player now because even though I go back to my earliest recordings, I even found a, a, a radio, a BBC radio broadcast that I did um, back in the mid 70s. And while my playing is kind of different, and of course it's a different guitar, you can tell it's me. I can tell, uh, you know, and if I play it to anybody who knows my playing, they can tell that. So I've actually done things of listening to lots of recordings over the years. And the guitar sound is a little different. Sometimes it's recorded a little better. Um, but, and, and it's a variety of guitars that I, I played. But you can still hear it's me. There is still some kind of thread of my sound coming in i can listen to something and say oh i think that was the barker i was playing or oh no that was that uh that was my yamaha prototype i was playing there i can tell a little little thing in there but basically you can hear it's the same person i've got relatives who know nothing about music at all and they they hear me play and they say that was you playing they can tell it was it was me playing. They know what it sounds like. It's like hearing somebody's voice, and you know that person's voice. And for, for me, that has been the, the most important thing for me was to have my own sound. And in my early days, I was talking about when I said, you know, I wasn't I wasn't a flexible, versatile player. I couldn't play a bit like this and a bit of country and a bit of that. Whatever guitar, if I picked up a Telecaster, I had a Fender Telecaster for a, a lot of work in those days, it still sounded the same as if I was playing my Johnny Smith. <laughs> and I think there's something wrong with me because every time, it doesn't matter what guitar I pick up, it sounds the same. And it bugged me at first. And then I realized, no, actually, this is, this is what you want to do. You've... I obviously have some kind of sound in my mind, in my body that comes out in whatever guitar I play. I've done a couple of recordings. I've just finished a recording with my daughter-in-law, Alison Burns. I play a lot of classical guitar on that. Uh, not classical guitar, but classical instruments. I play a Rubio, uh, a beautiful instrument that I borrowed in New York for it. And I did an album called um, Love Songs of guitar duets, on all on nylon string guitar. And even though I had, I had to adjust my playing to playing on a nylon string, because there's certain things you can't do. And there's certain like in, inflections that you can't play on a nylon string, just, just doesn't work. But you can hear it, that I can hear that it's me. And when I was listening, to, I've been listening to this latest recording that I'm doing. And I go, wow, yeah, that's, that's me playing a nylon string. You know, I can really hear that. Uh, you, you said something that I just want to tease out a little bit more, Martin, because I think it's such an important point. In one of my recent discussions, I was talking with the classical guitarist Laura Snowden, and we were reflecting mm. on this, and you've echoed it just now. I always find it odd where musicians say, I want to kind of find my sound, because it, it kind of sounds like they're kind of going out into the wilderness and hunting for something and bringing it back. And I think you're right. It's more about it's already in you. And it just takes a lot of time and experience to be willing to give yourself permission to let it come out. Mm. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I didn't find my my sound. It was just there. It was there. And um, at one point, many, many times I wanted to change it, you know, can I can I play a little bit bit different? But I, I, maybe I need another guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I play. Oh, it still sounds like me again. So you have to embrace it. It's like your, it's like your voice, um, your, your your speaking voice. You may want to change your speaking voice in some way, or your accent, or uh, and to a degree you can kind of work on that in the same way that a, you know a singer works on the the tone of their voice and everything. So maybe you say, okay, I want to speak more, kind of got a bit more Richard Burton in, in my voice, but that's actually not my natural voice. I'm just doing an impression uh, of somebody. And there's a lot of singers that do that, that singers that, um, because I actually, I'm very inspired by singers. In more recent years, probably the 10, 15 years, I listen to singers a lot and I've learned a lot from singers. And uh, one of the things I know, having worked with singers and, and very good singers, they, they tell you this, that 
um, been pointed out to me when you hear a singer that is actually trying to sing like somebody else. It sounds good, but you can see basically what what they're doing is doing they're doing an impression of mm. of, of another singer uh, rather than having their own voice. It happens a lot with singers, so they just become like impressionists. Mm. And uh, I I just wasn't a very good impressionist on the guitar. <laughs> I couldn't copy other people. I could never sound like someone else. So that that I thought. I thought was a disadvantage in the early days was actually obviously don't I say my my destiny but in a way that was kind of that was my direction no, I, I know what you mean you you want to be the best version of you not a kind of budget version of someone else I, I know exactly what you mean yeah and um as I said earlier about the the early days when because I had a lot of a lot of negativity at the beginning. We we come from the UK, so you <laughs> there's always people telling you you can't do something. <laughs> so oh no yeah yeah you can't do that. And so when I wanted to be a professional musician, everyone said no you can't be a pro you know you can't do that. Well earn, earn a living playing music. No you can't do that. No, no, no. Then when I was doing that, and I said actually I I, I just want to cut out all that other work. I just want to play jazz. Oh you. You can't just play jazz. And then I went, got even crazier. I said, I want to play jazz solo, <laughs> guitar, solo guitar jazz. Now that's really, no, you, you can't do that. And then I did that and uh, just through ignoring people uh, really and realizing that that was, uh, that was what, what, what I kind of needed, needed to do. But having the confidence in that, because sometimes you can say to yourself, well, I would like to do such and such a thing, but then, and I've seen it in some musicians and they're really good at something, but they want to be somebody else. They actually want to do, say, you know, they can be a really good jazz guitar player. They say, yeah, but I, I really want to play classical guitar. And they play classical guitar and they can't play classical guitar anywhere near as well as they can to just do what you do. And really, kind of that—that's what I did. I, I just, um, and you know, my roots are in, in jazz, and, and that's what—that's what I was going to do. And I was fortunate to meet my mentors along the way, who uh, steered me in the right direction. This kind of leads me nicely to what I wanted to ask you next, Martin, because what's kind of been revealed through. The discussion we've had so far is what an incredible and rich journey you've had you've clearly learned a lot of valuable lessons on the way but i wonder if you had to boil it down to one thing what would you say is the single most valuable lesson you've learned on this journey that you've been on oh, it's difficult for me to answer as a single <laughs> as a single lesson um because, you know, I, I could say, well, you know, just just carry on doggedly doing your thing, but you may be in the wrong direction. I would, uh, I could have gone in the wrong direction quite easily. But fortunately, I think coming back to what I said earlier, and I wasn't expecting to talk about this, but having really good mentors that you that you trust and uh, have the wisdom and the knowledge and listen to them because there were times when I thought, oh, I think I'll do that. And then I said, no, you know what, you know what you really should do. And then I went off on my own thing to try that. Said, well, yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's not really, uh, having, having people you can, you can, you can trust. And, you know, it's, things are very different now because the musical world that I, I came into doesn't exist anymore. That's another thing you have to remember. And of course, it's changed in such a way that now uh, I was fortunate because my dad played music and, he, and that's why I got into playing jazz and his friends did. And they used to come to the house. I used to go to my dad's gigs. They'd, they'd let me play. Uh, there wasn't... Uh, there, there wasn't formal education in jazz. If, um, 
I don't know what would have happened if it, it would have been, yeah, things would have gone in a different direction then. I could have gone to music college, but I would have had to play classical guitar. And as much as I love classical guitar, I knew that I wouldn't be able to do it. I knew that it wasn't what I was about. And I learned some classical pieces, but you know what used to happen? I'd sit there and go. stop myself and I thought now <laughs> I can't do that so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to play anything I'm not that kind of musician you know I'm not an interpretive musician maybe you call it where I could take a piece interpret it in the way that you thought the the composer wished it to be played you know I'm an improviser so give me a piece of music give me lagrima I'll give you a version of that but it may offend some people, so I, <laughs> I, I just wouldn't be able to stop myself from from doing that. <laughs> no, there's some good answers that I, I, I like the the idea of choose your mentors well, because you're, you're right. You want people to be on the side of the musician you could be, and that mm. sometimes means that they have to say things that you might not want to hear. I, yes, I, they do. That, yeah, that was, a, that was a good one, and and I also like the idea of you know you. You have to listen to what something deep within you wants to do musically and sometimes that that means you have to follow that rather than maybe what you initially think mm. you want I, th I think those are really good good lessons to have learned on the journey yeah when you have doubts that's when the, the mentors kick in if you have a doubt about that you need a little affirmation from somebody or that 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 guidance because you have a, a doubt but you may be yeah uh you need the people that have been on that journey themselves maybe not this obviously not the same journey because every journey is different but um the other thing is then taking that on from there is what you've you learn from your mentors and from the your experience it's there is a natural progression after that or there should be that then you pass it on and I think probably my one, one of the things I would tell all my students, you know, um, I have online students and uh, on my online school and they'll they'll play and they um, solo guitar, solo guitar players, bedroom players, they just play for themselves, you know, and I said, play for somebody, you know, just anybody just play one person. Play for your, start off playing for your cat and then, <laughs> then, then spread it out from there. Play for the dog and, and then play for the neighbor and then, you know, share it. And because I always, I, I never had any interest in playing on my own, which sounds bizarre for somebody that plays solo guitar, but I don't like playing on my own in a room on my own for myself. I always found that if I had a, an audience, and it was not a sh it's not a show off thing, uh, because I was actually very shy as a kid, and I, I didn't really want any attention. I didn't want people really looking at me. But I found if I had people that I could actually play to, then what I was doing had a purpose. That's 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 it. And I I fought against my shyness and my fear of of people looking at me being the center of attention and uh, but i said well no i i need to share this so you can tell that now i'm not a shy person uh, uh, at all but i can um i love playing for people and i i think that is something if you can do 
doesn't matter how you play how well you play music or how well you think you play music or or don't think you play well just play for just play for people and uh, and, and share it about that, that's that's for me is the the most important part we when we start off for a long time it's all about it's all about me i've got to do this I, me 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 i've got to become me and i go and then everyone can come and see me and then me as <laughs> you go and then there's a, a point where you come it, it kind of fit me where it flips and so this is nothing to do with me this is about others and that is that's a real turning point so so now and i think that came for me when when I when I started to teach when I was asked to teach because I thought oh no I'm, I'm not going to teach I wouldn't know how to teach I was never taught myself how do you teach somebody what happens in a guitar lesson I've never been to one <laughs> so uh, I started to kind of teach in a way of just kind of giving advice and then I thought I don't know whether I'm any good at this um, but I'll give it a try because I was asked to do it online in the early days of online interactive teaching on artist works. Okay, I'll give it a try. And then I thought, well, how do I know if I'm any good at it? And then I started looking at video exchanges I did with students. And every time another video came in, they just played that bit better and a bit better and a bit better. And I thought, well, whatever I'm doing, and it's not very orthodox and it's not theory based at all, something's working because they play better. And they say, everyone's telling me I play better. <laughs> so something works. Uh, so, you know, my, my path has, has never been orthodox, certainly by today's standard. It was very normal when I started to play. Guitar players never um, went to a college or anything, unless they play classical guitar. And um, that's why we're all notoriously bad readers, because we just all learn by ear. Yeah, we putting records on and playing for each other. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone into some really interesting philosophical areas with what you've just been talking about there, Martin. And I wonder if we could carry on down that path just for a moment, because I'd, I'd like to put a question to you. I ask all of my guests on Talking Music. I think anyone who's ever picked up an instrument and has tried to learn it has at some point aspired to be a good musician. Well, I hope they have anyway. <laughs> but in order to hit a target, you kind of have to know what you're aiming at. We have to kind of give it a definition in order to achieve it. Every person I ask gives a slightly different answer. So I'd like to know what your answer is. What does it mean to you to be a good musician? Okay, well, that target, I think, the word I would use is heroes. If you have musical heroes and heroines, then you have something to aspire to. And uh, whether you, you're you fortunate enough to know them personally, get to be with them, or if it's just listening to recordings or watching old videos or, or, or something, but you can see wow, I would like to do something like that. And also expanding it, not just, uh, you know, expanding it outside of your own instrument. Like I've learned a lot from, from listening to singers. I learned a lot from piano players uh, in particular. Um, jazz musicians have this, uh, and it's, it's, it's become it's become something that's become even bigger now that we have formal jazz education, which didn't exist when I was when I started, is they feel they have to know everything. <laughs> and something I learned along the way, and it came quite late, although I don't need to know everything. And how that came about was because I started working with musicians from other areas of music who when, could be classed, depending what the way you measure this, could be classed as being not very good musicians. But my goodness, they know how to tell a story. They know how to communicate. 
they they know how to move people with uh without knowing a lot about harmony without even being able to play their instrument very well but they can do something and so i that was a big revelation f for me and i in fact i had this conversation with a, a young piano player i i know um recently and i told him that and his light his face lit up and he said i discovered that during lockdown he said i i was sort of questioned myself as a musician he's a jazz musician a very good jazz piano player i love his playing and he plays in a certain genre a certain style uh, that he likes and he, he said it suddenly dawned on me i don't have to be able to play everything and to know everything and that takes a lot of pressure off you and i pass that on to a lot of young jazz musicians that have kind of been through the the uh, jazz education machine as it were and and just say it doesn't matter you don't need to know they, they ask me about things and, you know, and they ask me a question and i don't understand the question they say but you they ask they say that about modes i said well i don't know anything about modes i don't i don't know that but you played that you, you you just played oh did i oh all right okay but i didn't i didn't know that i just played that by ear i didn't have a name for it uh, or, or anything and then i'll say to them you know you don't need to know everything if you know what that sounds like it's like a it's like a a painter with a with a palette of colors i know what color i want to use for something you know you can you could go to art school which would be a fantastic wonderful wonderful thing to do everybody who wants to be an artist would benefit greatly from doing that but then there comes a point where you don't need to know exactly you don't need to look up how to mix those colors how to get that texture there comes a time when a chef doesn't need the recipe book anymore and can actually adapt that recipe to create something that is is their own creation uh, 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 from that so um i've you know i never kind of went from the recipe book i just and i've i played music like like your grandmother cooked oh a bit of this how did you cook that how much of that do you need in there i oh, just put a bit of that in <laughs> they didn't measure anything out but just kind of knew and it's like that with when i'm improvising i know what flavors what colors i want and i know how to create those i know that if i want a, a major chord to sound a bit jazzier I, a six will do that a nine will do that if i want something to sound sweet a major seven will do that if i want it to sound edgy a flat five will do that if i want a real kind of edge i can do a sharp nine if i want it to sound like it's going somewhere a dominant seventh these are the the colors on your palette these are the these are the ingredients for, you, for your your recipe but you don't actually have to there comes a point you can throw the recipe book away because you you know how to do it that, that's a good definition to, to, to paraphrase a little bit a, a lot of the things you're talking about are relating to this idea that it's not an intellectual exercise being a good musician it's actually having an ear and, and following that ear and, yes. and I, I really like that answer yeah, you know, my my great pal Jack Emblo, who played accordion in in my band, wonderful musician. He was on so many film sessions, and I remember once saying to him, "I said, you know, I never really learned to read music properly." And you know, and he said, "There was a lot of great music around before anybody wrote it down." <laughs> so I, I'm sure when you go to uh, around the world, you go to various cultures indigenous cultures i'm sure that when somebody's playing a, 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 a indigenous people playing instruments that they've been playing for thousands of years and uh the dad shows the son or the daughter uh something i'm sure they don't could you write that out for me dad <laughs> can i have it in tab <laughs> no they just do it they just do it and we yeah we can um 
I, as I said, you know, I said when I sometimes I'm asked questions and I don't really understand them, I get them, I have to get sometimes to explain the question to me in a bit in more simple terms. Then I understand it and then I can give an answer. So I do actually know the answer to the question. Hmm. I do actually know what they're talking about, but I, I don't know, I don't use that language because hmm. I wasn't brought up that, that way. And in a way, it's, it's very, it frees you in a way because you don't have to uh, another thing i say to all my students they say can i play this interval here w with that you know and they'll kind of get theoretical about it can that, that be played and i say how does it make you feel does it make you feel edgy does it make you feel uncomfortable yeah it does well it's probably not right unless the the, the you want it to to have that kind of edgy uncomfortable sound about it but if that's not what you're aiming for then it's not right you know does this town you know uh, we can use use our gut feelings it's like that in life i do that a lot generally because you know if you think if you want to make a decision and and you say well i wonder yeah i think maybe i should do that or if I did that, that, that may, then you get into that thinking thing and you're never going to come up with a good answer. But if you actually stop, take a few breaths, hold your, 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 your hand here in your stomach, ask yourself that question again. How does that make me feel? What do you think I should do? What, what should be done? invariably you will find find the right answer it's once we start going yes but if i do that and i do that and i do that and one of the great things about imp jazz improvisation you don't have time to do that <laughs> it's not like composing <laughs> you know because you've got decisions to make like composing Com improvisation is just like composing except you're doing it in in the uh in the moment and you're you're tapping in on your your knowledge and experience uh, but it's, I think it was, it was Wayne Shorter said, he was asked the difference between when he composes and when he improvises. And he said, he said, when I compose, I improvise slowly. And when I improvise, I compose quickly. <laughs> it's a great way of putting it. Yeah. And, and the discussion about using your ears kind of leads me to where I wanted to go next, because having talked about what being a good musician means, I'd like to drill into a couple of areas of your musicianship that I think those watching and listening could really learn a lot from. And I'd like to start with using your ears. The flamenco tradition that I work in is similar to the jazz tradition in many ways. But one thing that I find is a really strong link is the fact that a lot of the great flamenco recordings, you can't just go out and buy a transcription book in notation mm. or tab of those if you want to study from the masters you you've got to sit there with the record and you've got to work it out yeah it's a great way of doing it it's how i learned and in the jazz world it sounds like you learned a lot of things that way as well but i often find a lot of students of both genres when they initially try to approach that they find it quite a difficult thing to do that the comment i'll often hear is I just don't know where to begin when it comes to working stuff out by ear. What would you say to someone who says that? Well, the first thing you have to do, if you listen to something in, in jazz, is to, to, to find the kind of the, the tone center of something. And relative pitch it is, you have to have relative pitch. So you have to know that if that's the one, you know where the five is D, you know where the major seven is D, you know where the third is major third. So um, what I did was I obviously developed that unknowingly from an early age. So when I heard, uh, when I heard Django play uh, a solo, I didn't try to learn all of the solo, but I picked out, oh, I like that phrase. I would sing that phrase. And then I would internalize, internalize that. 
then I would visualize it. I would imagine playing it on the guitar. And this is what I used to do as a kid when I was at school and I wasn't interested in school uh, at all. Um, and uh, I'd looking out the window, <laughs> you know, um, all, all the time. He's a daydreamer. <laughs> He'll, he'll come to nothing. He's a daydreamer. So I would be daydreaming. And then what I was actually doing, I was kind of creating music or maybe some music that I heard. And then I would internalize it. Um, so it's not out here somewhere. And it's not in this instrument. It's in me. And then from internalizing the music, I then visualize playing it. And it doesn't matter what key it's in it doesn't say oh well i I don't have perfect pitch just just relative pitch um and that's that's really how i i learned because in the early days not only could i not read and write music i didn't know there was music written down or, or you could read it or that's how it was done at the very beginning so i just committed everything to to ear but i internalized the music internalization and visualization, imagine it playing on, on your instrument and having relative pitch. When you have relative pitch, you can play in any key. And uh, that, that, isn't a, that isn't a problem. Uh, so I didn't, I, I know in, in, um, in, in jazz schools, they put a lot of emphasis on transcribing solos, which I think is a very good idea. And I think um, I think it's also a very good idea to develop your skills both in reading and writing uh, music. And it also makes a connection uh, as well. But then sometimes you can then become too dependent on the written music. I know even with my own abilities, limited abilities, reading um, and writing music, I know if I learn a piece of music and learn a song say uh, i've just done an album with my daughter-in-law alison burns uh, vocals and, and guitar and a couple of songs that she wanted to sing so i said if you get give me the chart so all i need is the chart the 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 uh, the melody and the chords on it so that will help me but i actually prefer to learn it by ear to hear it because if I learn it from that chart, something in my brain then makes me want to see that all the time. And I, I start becoming more visual of the written page rather than um, the music itself. So it's like you become one degree removed from it. Whereas if you just do it by ear, you'll bang into it. You're, you're right into the middle of where it's all happening. So I only, I, you know, I can read music and I can write music down, but, but uh, I only use it for reference purposes. And uh, there are times when I can't quite get something and I'll think, well, oh, I'll see if I can find the chart of that. And then I'll see it and go, ah, that's where it was. I, I didn't hear that because my, my ears aren't as good as they, they were when I was, when I was younger, I would just pick things up very quick. But um, it's just an age thing. So sometimes I might need a, a bit of help. But yeah, music, music, it doesn't come from this, this instrument. It doesn't come from outside. You create the music. And the best way to do that is to internalize it, have it inside you. And the best way to do that is to sing. I, I teach my students, uh, I, I get them to do exercises when, when I do my guitar retreats think sing plays and sometimes you'll get i'll get you know players to work in in pairs one sings they don't play the guitar because that's too they'll figure it out if they play the guitar sing a phrase now you play the phrase and you know just find a tone center <laughs> and then it sounds oh that's easy and then they try it and and even if they've been playing for a long time they get it wrong uh but once you start doing that it's like going to the gym you start building up those muscles and after a while it's 
you know, I used to like to swim. And if I took a long time off from swimming, one length and I was having to stop, you know, but by two, two days later, I was just going backwards and forwards and built up that. So it was the same kind of thing, internalizing the, the music. And that's the only problem. If you rely on transcribing, you just end up just one degree uh, removed. And it's harder to get away from it because you become a bit dependent. I know from my own experience. That's that's wonderful advice, Martin. I agree with everything you said, and I love that exercise, think, sync, play. That That's wonderful. I've, I've never come across that as an idea before. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I also, uh, yeah, I, 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 I do that with a lot of my, my students. And some of them have been playing a long time. And I think, why are we playing this child's game? this kid's game and and then they they try it a couple of times and they go "Ooh, <laughs> it's a bit more difficult than i thought <laughs> but it comes very quick once you once you do it um, i've never known anyone that's given up saying i can't do this in a very short time they'll get it and what happens there'll, there'll be a little there'll be a gap between actually somebody singing the phrase and you playing it and you'll make mistakes there'll be a gap but after a while, that gap becomes less and less. The mistakes become less and less. And then the two join together. So, now I'm not singing along to my playing, I'm playing along to my singing. It's, it's very different. It's the other way, the other way around. And, and you can hear that on a, a lot of the great jazz albums. You hear players doing that, and you you often hear it on flamenco recordings as well. There's certain mm. players where you, you can hear them yes. in the background doing that. So I I love how you tease that out. Thank you so much. <laughs> this this is wonderful, Martin. Um, this I'm conscious that we've been going for a long time already. So I'm going to pivot towards some of the questions towards the end of where we were going to go. I'd like to come back to the subject of listening to music. Earlier in my discussion with you, we talked about albums that you've performed on, that you enjoy the most out of yours, or as you put it, the ones that you don't cringe the most with. <laughs> Let's take your own playing out the equation though. Let's talk about albums that you weren't in the recording sessions with. What are your favorite albums? And this can be in any genre of music. And how have those albums influenced what you do on the guitar? Well, the first one I would think of would be, there's one version of Django Reinhardt playing, and Stefan Grappelli playing, I'll See You In My Dreams. old song from I think it was actually from the 20s so he recorded it in the in the 30s Django starts off by playing some little improvised solo guitar then he goes in and he only suggests the melody and it's improvised around that and then the improvisation it's the masterclass in melodic improvisation Often the way jazz improvisation is taught is, well, you can play this over that chord sequence. You can play these scales or you can play these modes uh, over that. They, they fit. I'm a melodic improviser, so there's an element of that in, in what I do. But mostly I'm teasing the, the, the melody. So you can use the the harm the harmony as your framework. You can use rhythmically as a framework as well, but you can also use the melody as a framework too. It doesn't mean that you're sticking with the melody or all, all the time, but it's like the melody is like a springboard takes you somewhere, and then you go back to that melody, and it gives you it springboards you somewhere else. And that recording of Django from the 1930s, I'll see you in my dreams. It's an absolute masterclass in uh, in melodic improvisation. So if this is a kind of a desert island discs type of thing, um, there was that, and then uh, there were records that my dad had of Fat Swaller. 
I loved his singing as well, singing Ain't Misbehaving, which was one of his songs. Because I remember the, that stride piano, and I got... I thought I, re I desperately want to be able to do that on the guitar. <laughs> we didn't have a piano. I'm glad we didn't have a piano in the house because I would have probably gone and started playing the piano instead. But yeah, those recordings. Um, I listen also a lot to symphonic music and and film music. Actually, I mean I'm a big fan of Ennio Morricone. Mm. And listening to or orchestrations and then putting them on here uh, is something that I like. I, I know I spoke about my dad's record collection, um, but my mum had a record collection as well, which was mostly Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, um, um, Nat King Cole, Matt Monroe, all those all those wonderful singers in of, of that era of that of that style and what struck me was the arrangements you know the, that nelson riddle and billy may robert farn and um i i've worked with two out of those three <laughs> uh, late, later on and like i said trying to get that stride piano onto the guitar do those piano type of things on the guitar. It was also, how can I create that mood they, that they've created with a full orchestra? How can I suggest that on, on the guitar? And with an orchestra, you've got a bigger palette. You've got lots more to, to play with. And that's the ultimate dream, uh, you know. Um, but to be able to play that on the guitar, and create that that mood because it's really when it comes down to it we're creating moods and we're telling stories you know, with with music that's how i that's how i see it so very often i will you know i can't sort of give um specific records so much there was one barney castle record that i have here still on vinyl um it was called music to listen to barney castle by very bad grammatically <laughs> title, <laughs> uh, but it was uh, Barney did all the arrangements as well because he was working in Hollywood on film sessions. So he had all the the best studio musicians, of which he was one. He was he was part of the Wrecking Crew, and he he wrote all these wonderful arrangements, kind of around his guitar playing, and that's a wonderful recording. Also, I. I was a big, always have been a big fan of of blues and you know the the feeling, the emotion of blues. My one of my dad's best friends uh, was Dick Bishop, who played guitar and banjo with um, Chris Barber and all of that that jazz revival of in in the UK. And he used to tour around Europe with a lot of the the old Delta blues guys like Big Bill Brunzi. So I listened to all of those records as well. Some of the Big Bill Bruins. I loved all, all of that, that, that kind of playing. I loved Big Bill Brunzi. And uh, then I heard uh, Kenny Burrell, who a very sophisticated jazz player deceptively simple in his playing great sound great phrasing but you he has the blues in his playing mm. and that really got to me it was like where the blues meets this kind of sophistication uh, uh, as well so he, obviously there was midnight blue which was a famous album of of his that has had a number of revivals over the years and even used in a lot of tv commercials uh, and there was another album that he made with a, uh, uh, a, a B3 organ player called Shirley Scott, 
Mm. She was a wonderful, mm. wonderful player. She was married to Stanley Tarantine, the, the saxophone player. And I remember that, that I still have that on vinyl just over here. And I just wore that record out. I just thought this was the coolest thing uh, I'd, I've, I'd ever heard. And uh, away from recordings, other experiences that I actually had firsthand was seeing Andre Segovia play when he was, I guess, in, I think in his mid seventies, he was at that time. And I did see Jimi Hendrix play at the Royal Albert Hall. Mm. Uh, when I was 13, my older brother took me along. So they were things that, uh, I say Jimi Hendrix experience, I, was an experience. It was one of the experiences that I, I again talk going back to stefan that i thought i must remember this this is uh, quite amazing i was only 13 and uh, the, the, one of the, there were two evenings one of those evenings is actually you can find it on youtube mm. and i i kind of look at I, I still remember where i sat and i still look out to see if i can can see myself but it's too it's too blurred mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah so those those first hand experiences uh, as well which are a very special the first time i heard barney play uh, the first hand experience or the the thousands i guess it would have been over 11 years how many times how many concerts did i play with stefan grappelli certainly many many hundreds and uh, all of those first hand experiences that um influenced me in, uh, and shaped me i don't actually listen to music that much now and uh I don't even play that much, uh, funnily enough, uh, because, you know, I was telling you about when I used to be at school and I would kind of internalize the music. That was a great skill that I developed from a young age. I didn't realize I was doing it. But now I can, a lot of my practicing is done up here. You know, I just internalize it, visualize it, then I go out and and do it and um, i don't often feel the need to actually pick up the guitar and play it although it's always nice when i when i do there's some wonderful recommendations there martin and you've you've picked some of my favorites as well kenny burrell has long mm. been one of my top musicians i i i have pretty much every album he's done as both a side man and yeah. uh, and his own ensembles and i can't get enough of that bluesy playing that he has yeah, a great sound and feel. Wonderful. I'd like to ask a quick follow up to this, if I may. It's a bit of an unfair one, but it's one of those awkward hypotheticals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But I'm, I'm going to go with it. <laughs> when you ask someone, what are your favorite albums? To a certain extent, you're kind of asking who are your heroes and why? If hypothetically, I were to hand you a magic wand right now, and by waving it, you could conjure up any of your musical heroes, either alive or dead, and just spend some time with them and ask them a question. Who would you choose and what would you ask? OK, I would have to choose Django. Uh, it seems the most obvious. I mean, there's others, too. I mean, there could be Duke Ellington and oh, my goodness. Debussy, there could be you know, there's many, but I would because I have that connection through Stefan with Django, and and Stefan used to sometimes talk to me about about Django, and um, I would like to meet Django, sit down, and say, and ask him actually, how do you see music? How do you visualize it? Because I have a feeling that he was somebody that visualized music um, as I do. Um, he was also um, he was also an artist. He was a painter, and I've dabbled in that myself as well. So I figured there's a part of our brains that uh, were active in, in in that particular area that we we shared something in that way and i know what i how i visualize things 
because when I'm playing the guitar and I really get into it, I'm not actually playing the physical guitar. I'm playing the visualization that I have, which doesn't take the form of a guitar, but there's kind of notes and there's space and things. I'm actually playing that and that then connects to this. And I want, I would like to ask him, I would like to ask Django, does that happen to you as well? Do you, do you have a kind of inst a mind instrument, an instrument that's going on in your mind that you, that you tap into, that you play and then sends messages to this big, lovely, beautiful piece of wood that, that you're, you're playing. I would like to know, you know, guess on what I'm saying is what's going on in your mind. <laughs> That's a fine choice and a very good question. Well, Martin, I'm very sad to say we're pretty much coming to the end of the interview now. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it though. And before I ask my final question, if people have been watching this and are thinking, I've got to hear more of what Martin's got to offer. I've got to check him out in concert. I've got to see where he's playing or what he's releasing. Where's the best place for them to go to find out? The most simple place to go is just to my website, martintaylor.com. And you can that will lead you, if you wish, <laughs> to other areas. You can become a patron of my online guitar school on Patreon, uh, where... I have lots and lots of videos, live performances, studio sessions, guitar conversations like this. In fact, I, I interviewed you on, uh, on, on one of those. And we have live hangouts as well, open mic sessions where everyone can play and share their playing too. Uh, my online guitar school at Artistworks is there. Um, Fibonacci Guitars, who make my guitars. There's also my tour dates wherever I'm playing and certainly if I'm playing somewhere near you I'd really love to see you that would be that would be wonderful that's probably the best best place to go martintaylor.com that's marvelous I've got two fairly short questions to finish with if I may okay the first one this is a very personal question so I've been debating whether or not to put this one to you but I'm going to go for it okay as artists, ultimately, none of us get to decide what we're remembered for. It's not in our gift to, to give that. But if you could choose, what would you ideally want your legacy to be as an artist? He told good stories. Well, I think when it is, that's what it's down to in the end. We're telling stories through this instrument. He told some good stories. That's a wonderful answer. I, I absolutely love that. My final question, and it's the question I always close interviews with. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. If you could go back in time and offer your younger self, the young musician, Martin Taylor, just one piece of advice, what would you do? Hmm. My piece of advice. I got that sort of general. Uh, I can give general ad advice. Um, I would say, are you, are you talking about uh, as a musician, the, my, me as a young musician? You as a young musician, yes. Just enjoy it and see where it takes you. <laughs> That's kind of what I did. Uh, in a way, but maybe that was because of time and place. Maybe that wouldn't be as easy now. Uh, but then, different time, different place. You just go maybe in a slightly different direction. But yeah, I think um, take advice from the wise. Avoid the unwise. <laughs> very wise words to end on <laughs> and with that martin taylor thank you for coming on the show and talking music thank you very much samuel i've really enjoyed it sorry i've spoken for so long <laughs> but you did ask me <laughs> <laughs>